Matthew chapter 5, and um, we've gone through a lot of the, we've gone through all the Beatitudes and, and into the, 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 um, the more of the meat of the teaching outside the Beatitudes now, and Jesus gives six things from the Old Testament that were just common knowledge. Basically, he starts off, you have heard that it was said. In other words, there's six things now. In the first one, he talks about murder, and he also talks about adultery and then divorce, and then giving of oaths or giving your word. He talks about revenge, and also talks about loving your enemies. These six things that we deal with for the next six weeks uh, with this. And the first one is murder, and it's interesting. And the, 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 the main issue of this particular teaching from Jesus is not murder at all. It's not killing that he's talking about. If you look at the whole thing, I'm going to read the passage, and then we'll just kind of expound on it, and then we'll pray. Verse 21, chapter 5, says, You have heard that it was said to people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the hell of fire. I'm sorry, the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering a gift at the altar and there remember that, you, that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. Go first and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle the matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do not do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge will hand you over to the officer, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Father, in Jesus' name, we just pray that you would just now help us to expound this word, Lord, help us to understand this, especially this major area, Lord God, of relating anger to murder and murder as a result of anger. Lord, we live in a, a very angry society. Lord, in our art, in our politics, in our news, in our world, everything around us, in our families, we see anger continually. We get angry, Lord, all the time. Lord, help us to understand what this means. And Lord, help us to understand the depth and the, the, the horrible fruit of an angry root that is not dealt with. Lord, I ask this in Jesus' mighty name that you would help us to understand this clearer. And Father, change our lives with this, Father. Direct our lives as we live in this world right now, Father, that is in, in rebellion, and consequently, extremely angry. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. I believe, I mean, I, I, this is very deep. It goes on even to the, the last part, which I won't deal with so much that much about going to court and settling things beforehand, um, which is always a good, good thing to do, to keep it out of court and settle things beforehand. But I do want to deal with the weighty, I believe, the weighty part of the section, which is the first two verses, basically, but you have said that it was. Uh, you have heard that it was said to people long ago, or to the ancients. Some uh, translations have that you shall not murder. Well, that goes back to the law of Moses. I mean, Jesus talking to his disciples, uh, being Jewish men, they would understand exactly what he's talking about. That is the fifth commandment: you shall not commit murder. You, that's what Jesus said: you shall not commit murder. But this is so important. If you follow with me, just just quickly, we'll go to about two or three other scripture verses here. I mean, again, this is reiterated. Go to Matthew. Uh, 19, 18. He says the same thing. He, meet, he meets the, the, the rich young ruler. And one of the things that he says to Jesus, why I'm so righteous, he says this, uh, verse 17, he says, why do, you call, uh, why, why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there's, a, there's only one who is good. Um, if you want eternal life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false witness or false testimony, honor your mother and father. Basically, that's the Ten Commandments. And then also to love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus reiterates this as well. This is one of the, the, the top commandments that one could keep. Also, go over to, to Romans 13, chapter 9, just to lay a foundation here of, of you know, the mindset of whom Jesus is talking to. Like, he says, you have heard that it's been said, which has been said quite a bit. Romans 13, 
chapter 9, in Paul's writings, <clears throat> it just says, The commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, let me just start with verse 8. Let no, let no debt remain outstanding except for continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. Basically, what he just said to the rich young ruler, Paul is just reiterating that. And whatever commandment there may be are summed up in this one commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Um, one is very interesting here, dealing with the church itself, though. Uh, look at 1 John chapter 3. We know that um, John chapter 3.16 is God so loved the world. Interesting, 1 John 3.16 says this. Um, well, I'm going to start with verse 15 and then go into 16. 1 John 3.15 and 16. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. Wow. So we're not even talking about killing somebody in that sense. So the, the, the already, you know, John's reiterating this, this, this teaching as well. Uh, even if you, if you hate your brother or your sister, he's a murderer, she's a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Just the opposite of killing them with with hatred and killing them with, and hatred, of course, just doesn't happen. It, it, it comes over a period of time, usually of just being angry or being hurt, and that comes out, and that's John's writing, that that's equivalent to murder, hating. So Jesus is saying that the root of, of murder is anger. An angry, murderous spirit root pr produces a killing. There's a killing of, 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 I mean, you know, you look at it practically, so much of even first and second degree murder is, you know, is based on a, um, a feeling of just being angry, being ripped off. I, 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 anger is one definition I use of anger would be something when your rights are being denied in some way, it will cause you to, to, to come up, even on the inside. You may not say this, you know, consciously, but my rights are being denied. I have a right to do what the something I want to do and somebody is stopping me or something is stopping me and, and then, therefore something rises up or something is stopping somebody else from doing it and I'm defending that person. But there's something that's being denied that should be mine. And when that is not checked, friends, then we end up doing things that are very detrimental. The first century Jew recognized that anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. That's That's... Um, you know, as it is in every society. I was talking to a friend of mine over the weekend, and he just said, you know, there's some things that are just universal laws. No matter if you're Christian or not, most societies have restrictions and even penalties for those who murder, or even some, some who steal. There may be some that maybe glorify that in some aspects, but those are very few and far between. But there are most societies who come against the idea of killing a life um, and stealing and basically the whole Ten Commandments. But look, if you would, what are the things that, 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 that anger leads to? And I've seen this so many times. I, I've, I've done counseling with uh, families. I've done counseling with people on the street, ex-offenders. And this, and what I see what, what anger leads to, there's one particular um, situation, one, one biblical example. Look at Daniel chapter 3. Look what anger does. Um, Nebuchadnezzar is absolutely furious because the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or men, young men, will not bow down to his statue. I mean, this is what he wants. His will is being thwarted, and his anger rises up. And look what it says. I mean, he's just, he's, he is in a rage. I mean, anger leads to a, 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 a total breakdown of just regular rational behavior. Verse 13 says, Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These three men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve the gods and worship the image of gold I've set up? And then go down to verse 19. The Nebuchadnezzar was furious, furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because they would not bow down. They would not do what he says. His will was being thwarted, he was furious, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times harder than usual. He's, I mean, basically he's lost control of, of even just regular rational behavior. 
is not just burn him to death, heat it up seven times, he's so furious. So hot was this furnace. Look at verse 20. The, the, he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in the army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and their clothes, were bound and thrown into the, fire, the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent, he's so angry, he's not thinking right, so angry and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He lost some of his strongest soldiers just because he's so freaked out. And he wants them to, to really burn and you know, do it seven times. Irrational. Anger leads to a rage, which leads to irrational thinking. I've seen anger lead to lust. I've seen uh, people in relationships sometimes and they get angry with their spouse for something or their, their partner or whatever and they purposely go out after somebody else. They don't even like the other person but just to get back because the anger or suddenly their eyes are off their spouse or their partner or something, and then now they're looking afield because of anger. The mind is turned. Of course, anger leads to sin. And I'm going to get to that towards the end of this teaching about how we deal with anger, because anger, if it is not abated, all of our anger, myself, you, all of us, if our anger is not controlled, it will lead to sin. Anger can just, and I tell you, anger can justify any action at the moment. It overtakes every and all rationale. Anger is self-centered. The Bible says we are to be angry, but do not sin. Anger is just a part of our nature in a fallen world. And anger in and of itself is not necessarily evil. But it's truly how we deal with anger. It can lead to murder. It can lead to lust. It can, it can lead to uh, adultery can lead to sin. It leads to all these things if it is not handled. As a matter of fact, in Jesus, the absolute fruit, the, 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 the largest fruit, the end result, if it's not checked at all, it leads to murder. This is, is a death. It could lead to a death of a person or could lead to a death of a relationship, a death of peace that you have with God. It's something, there is a death that happens with anger. But he goes on to say, as far as just, you know, the anger, but even just the name calling, and this is a clear sign of something that's not right in your spirit in relation to God. It says, but whoever, he says, whoever murders will be subject to judgment. Verse 22, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother, he's just talking about anger now, angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka, now, this is the only time this word is used in the Bible. Um, basically, it just means a lightheaded person, an airhead, a, a real derog but it was a real derogatory term, brainless person. Just, you know, you're just, you know, you're just a, a flake. You know, you're just you're a rocker. Um, it's in, in, in the day right now, when Jesus is using that, it's, it's highly degrading, highly disrespectful. It was, it was a word that was, was, it was, a, it was a hated word, and you would use it um, if you really want to just absolutely tear somebody down, just, just ruin their reputation, just tear them down, you just call them raka. Uh, it is the only time, the only passage where the Bible uses this term, um, and, and it, it, it just comes from uh, an Aramaic word, um, rika, but pronounced raka. Uh, as I said, very derogatorily, meaning empty headed, insinuating the person is just absolutely stupid or inferior. It puts you in a superiority place. It, 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 be, it, beefs, it just beefs you up. You crush the other person to lift yourself up when you're angry. It was an offensive name used to show utter contempt for the other person. And Jesus warned that the use of such a word to describe somebody was tantamount to murder, deserving the severest punishment of the law. There's an example I'll give about how your testimony to somebody could kill somebody. I've given this testimony before because uh, it has stuck with me. As a matter of fact, it happened, it's, it's, the true event happened 25 years ago. And I remember this plainly. There's a justice, Supreme Court justice on the, on the Supreme Court now in the United States, Justice Thomas. And he was a very astute, educated black man. And he was going through the Senate hearings and he was just about ready to be confirmed. And out of nowhere, this woman, Anita Hill, comes up very articulate, very smart. Again, uh, this other black woman, so it wasn't a racial thing. This, this black woman was, came up and said, 10 years ago, he sexually abused me. 
And this shocked the court. And this is live around the world on CNN. Everybody's looking at it. And here's this judge that had a flawless, flawless testimony. His whole career was flawless, polished. He's this close to the Supreme Court. And this woman comes up and says, no, 10 years ago, he sexually harassed me. So that sent shockwaves all over the place. To make a long story short, he was voted in. He was, he was, he was uh, accepted. And now he's on the Supreme Court. But he said... And that the whole world now thinks, because this shadow is over his head now. Oh, he just got away with it. You know, he actually sexually abused her, but now he, he ended up getting away with it. But he said, and this is just Justice Thomas's thing, he said, I would rather have faced an assassin's bullet than to have my reputation smeared all over around the world, as if I'm some sort of a rapist. Not a rapist, but um, a sexual predator. He goes, she, she tried, it was the enemy trying, coming in, this is his testimony. She still says, no, he got away with it, he did this to me. His testimony is, no, I didn't touch it, this is just a lie. We never know, except he was found innocent by the Senate. He's on the Supreme Court, even today, he's still there, and he's a good judge. But his testimony is, I would rather have faced an assassin's bullet. Kill me before you ruin my reputation the way it's ruined. Because now every time they hear ju just, Justice Thomas, they think, oh yeah, Anita Hill. He's always associated with, whether it's true or not, boom, it's there. It's been spoken. That's why Jesus says, you call somebody Raka. You, 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 you label them airhead. You label them fool. That's what he says going on later on. If you just say you fool, and, and it sticks. So even though the person, people may just laugh it off or whatever, but whenever they think of that person now, they think, oh yeah, the fool. And it just sticks with them. You've, 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 you've killed their reputation. You've ruined their uh, livelihood, perhaps, sometimes, if you just give a, a false you know, testimony about somebody. And this is why, you know, if you just say that, it's like, it is like murder. You can kill them. I tell, gossip kills. You want to ruin somebody's reputation? Just spread, some, just spread a lie. I don't even have time. I have some scripture verses in, in Proverbs. It goes on about the power of the tongue. It can ruin lives. And that's what Jesus is saying right now. He says, I tell you, anyone who is angry, and it comes from anger, angry with his brother, and with, with uncontrolled anger, you can justify anything. Because you are now the center of what you're doing, and whatever you say, you may regret it later on, but the words are already out. But at that time, you feel justified saying it. You can yell at your kids, you can do this, you can smack somebody, you can put your hand through a wall. Whatever you do with anger, at that time, at that second, you justify doing it. I'm so angry. Bang! I'm so angry. You kick someone. I'm so angry. You just tear somebody down. And at that time, you are a law unto yourself. That's what's danger. That's the danger with anger. You're a law to yourself. And I'm going to deal with that and how to, how to, how to deal with that. Um, the attitude of the heart is the same. And it's this attitude that makes a person morally guilty before God. I don't have to kill somebody. I can just speak it. This person is, pss, 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 pss. hey, pss, pss, oh, yeah, yeah. oh, is he really? Oh, yeah, yeah, stay away from him. Oh, yeah, I will. Don't buy from him because he's, pss, 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 I'll just kill his business. Oh, yeah, um, um, somebody ate their food in me. I really got sick, man. I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't eat at that place. It's really bad. Man. Boom, you just kill it. You kill their business, you kill their reputation. And, you know, the attitude of the heart is the same. And this attitude is to make the person morally right before God. I could have an anger within my heart. I may not even say it, but I'm thinking it. You know, Jesus, we're going to look at this later on with, with adultery and lust. That even if you look at somebody lustfully, you've already done it. God sees it. I tell you, friends, this is where we have to you know, check my own heart. You know, we do live in an angry society. And so, and then he issues this third one. He says, you know, do, do not murder. And then don't say the raka. And then he also says, you know, and anyone who says you fool is in danger of the fires of hell. So Jesus not only warns us against expressing, expressing unrighteous anger, which can lead to murder, but he also com commands us about any denunciation or ins insults, name calling has to be avoided. And these abusive words reveal the true intent of one's heart and mind in which we'll be held for judgment. And it's good to do an inventory now. Even today, like I said, I, I, this teaching I've had to deal with even myself, even today. Because things that happen and, you know, I have to just check my heart. God, 
what, why am I feeling, you know, this, this anger towards this or that? I say, okay, God. And then we're going to deal with how to deal with anger in a second. You know, the Lord examines the heart. And that's what this issue is, the issue of the heart. The heart of the problem is the problem with the heart. That's why Jesus says, if you do it even in your heart, I see it. You don't even have to do it, but the problem is already there. Turn with me. Go to Jeremiah 17. And it's just about two or three verses here. I want to just show you the, the proof of this about going, going to the heart. And God knows it. And this is Old Testament teaching, friends. This is just not New Testament. It wasn't new with Jesus. He said this before. Jeremiah 17.10. I, the Lord, Jeremiah 17.10. Jeremiah comes after Isaiah. Jeremiah 17, right before Ezekiel. Verse 17, I, the Lord, search the heart. I examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. So I will see what their deeds are doing, but I also check the heart. One of the biggest crimes against God, and we see this with the Pharisees, is hypocrisy. I can be nice and nicer to people, but he searches my heart, friends to see if I'm really sincere, if I really do say, well, yes, I really, you know, I think you want, you know, it doesn't bother me at all what you're doing. Oh, no, this is really fine. I can say what I want. And if my heart is throwing knives at the person, God sees it. Look at 1 Samuel. Go back a few book, books. 1 Samuel, chapter 16. 1 Samuel 16, chapter 7. Very similar verse. 1 Samuel, chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance, his height, for I have rejected him. Because Saul was a natural choice. He was tall, he was good looking, he was head and shoulders over every single Israeli man. I mean, he was, he, he was the man. There's no doubt. He's good looking. He says, listen, don't go by appearances. For I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. Keep that on board, friends. Take that on board. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. That's why Jesus says, when you've done it in your heart, God sees it. He looks upon the heart. And look at First Chronicles. Just go a few verses, a few books to your right. Uh, 1 Chronicles. Again, these are all similar passages. But just to, to reinforce what I'm saying here, 1 Chronicles 28. 1 Chronicles 28, verse 9. Talking to Solomon, the son of David. And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the Lord of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a, mind, with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, which Solomon did, he will reject you forever. So that's when he's chosen to be a vessel to do the sanctuary. But again, God searches the heart. So you may think, well, I didn't do anything, and I, you know, I'm, I'm living my life, my eyes are straight ahead, I'm, I'm not being angry or whatever. If you harbor that anger in your heart, God sees it. I tell you right now, too, that anger will somehow get out. Some way. Some way. It's, it's got, if you harbor it in your heart, it's going to come out sooner or later. But the last part of the thing I want to talk about now, again, this is, um, again, it's, uh, we have these messages now that are 30 to 40 minutes long, so they're, they're just good bite-sized things here. Uh, so I'm not going to deal with dealing with going to court as the Matthew passage leads into, but dealing with anger, and this is very important. I've talked about the biblical definitions of anger and the result of it biblically, but how do we deal with it? I mean, it'd be, it'd be terrible if I just leave it right there and not help you how to deal with anger. Listen closely, because in dealing with anger now, when angry, we have two choices. We have two choices. We can either, what I call, we can either react or we respond. And I'll tell you what I mean. 
I've said already, anger in and of itself is not sin. And Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, it even says, be angry, but do not sin. Yeah, there's a lot of things to be angry over, especially if you're walking close with the Lord. We see our society. I'm angry with our society. I'm angry with, it, with what's happening. Um, and I have to lay, I have to, and every day I have to lay this before the Lord. There's a stirring in my heart. Listen, look, read the Bible. God gets angry. The wrath of God. God gets angry. The anger of the Lord kindled against you know, Israel. The anger of the Lord. Jesus got angry. Anger is not the sin. By nature, we, we, you know, we do get angry because things do not go according to the way that we want them to go, and it stirs up an anger within us. That's just natural. It's God-given, actually. You know, like I said, repeatedly in the Old Testament, the anger of the Lord. In the New Testament, to follow with me closely, keep your, keep your fingers there, but I mean, John chapter 2, when Jesus <clears throat> goes into the temple, and this is not at the beginning of his ministry, even though it's John chapter 2, uh, this basically is towards the end of his, uh, his ministry. There's no chronological order in John, but this is, he cleansed the temple. He does it also in the other gospels. This is, he only does this once. Um, it says, Jesus was angry when he saw um, what they've done to his father's house. I mean, look at verse 15. So he made a whip. Well, uh, verse 14, in the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at the tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove them from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He, he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. And those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered what was written. Zeal for my father's house has consumed me. Jesus walked in there and he saw an absolute um, marketplace where there should be a house of prayer. He was stirred. He tipped over tables. I've heard people say, well, Jesus lost his temper. No, he did not. Jesus never lost anything. Matter of fact, he walked in the total fruit of the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. He was absolutely controlled. See, anger makes us lose our self-control. Jesus did not lose his self-control. He was angry, but he did not sin. It was the right response from God to turn over, to bring on that level judgment there, tip over the tables, force them out in complete control but being angry. Look at um, Mark chapter 5. Again, these are important because it is important to see that, yes, we do get angry. And the example we have all the time in our lives should be Jesus. Chapter, Mark chapter 3, verse 5. I'm going to start with verse 4 because he, he's just about to heal a man who's, who's been lame. He's on the Sabbath. And he tells him his sins are forgiven, which is for, easy to say. Your sins are forgiven or pick up your mat and walk. And that's where we pick up the narrative in verse 4. And Jesus asked him, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or do evil, to save a life uh, or to kill it? And they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger. Look what it says. This is Jesus. And deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. Now, Jesus was not in sin because he looked at them in anger. He saw the self-righteousness. He saw this, you know, here's, a, here's somebody who is... Um, who is going to be healed, it happened to be a Sabbath, and they were getting on his case and saying that he, was, he had a demon, yeah, this is wrong, they shouldn't be doing this, and it angered him. But he did not sin. Look, again, this is true with the body of Christ. The last one, and then we're going to, I'm going to deal with what I said before. I, I, I'll give a few other ones too, but I want us to have a good biblical theology here. Go to James chapter 1. Again, dealing with anger. James chapter 1, verse 20. I'm going to start with verse 19. James chapter 1, verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. It doesn't say and, and, do, and never to be angry. No, slow to become angry. The fruit of the Spirit is also patience, self-control, gentle. Doesn't mean that you will not get angry, but you're slow to anger. Because a human anger, watch this, verse 20, human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Amen? So if I am responding to a situation in my human anger, I cannot, um, 
I cannot please or produce the righteousness that God desires. So there is a response with my anger that is displeasing to God. But then again, we see in Jesus, there is a reaction or there's a reaction to my anger that's displeasing to God, but there's a response that I can have that is pleasing to God. And we see in Jesus, we have to see, have to see um, how, how do we balance that out. Note the scriptures, if you would. You can just write these down if you, just to go fast. I mean, Psalms 145, verse 8. And this is the character of God. Again, going with that James passage, that we should be slow to anger. Psalm 145, verse 8. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. This is the Old Testament God. Many people say, oh, he's a God of wrath. He's a God of judgment. Friends, there's judgment and wrath in the New Testament too. This is Old Testament. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. And just one more verse before I deal with the, the reaction and the responding. Just Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15, a well-known verse. Proverbs 15, verse 1. Proverbs 15, verse 1. And this is, I said this recently. There's a presidential candidate going around. Yeah, this, I'm just dating this teaching right now. The states are in the midst of a presidential um, election, and there's one candidate. I, I'd like to speak this to. Chapter 15, verse 1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A gentle answer turns away wrath. So if somebody's coming against you, there's a situation, and then the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness, self-control, patient. If you're walking in the... It doesn't mean you won't get angry. But it means you walk self-controlled, you're gentle, you're patient. And that's where I'm going to get on with the reacting versus responding. But that's, that is the fruit of the Spirit. But if you have a harsh word, friends, that's going to stir up anger. And that is so true. You could just say... I, mean, I tell you, I don't, don't do this, but as an example, if you, if, if you walk in a bus and... Uh, maybe somebody hits you with something, and you get angry with the person, that person can just, just snap right back at you. Well, they want you to move your feet, and I'm blah, 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 blah. You know, you know, excuse me, no, you did this. If they come in and knock you, you say, oh, that's all right, my friend, don't worry about it. And they say, oh, well, thank you for that, or whatever. Okay, and they just go on. The rat, if you come back at them with an angry attitude, angry spirit, that will even provoke even a greater anger. A gentle answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. Look at verse 18, same thing, chapter 15, 18. A hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but one who is patient calms a quarrel. Amen? A hot-tempered person stirs up conflict. That means if, if there's something stirring on, someone who's hot-tempered, not controlled, by the way, that's what I'm saying, or one who's quick to react, he will stir up the conflict even more. But someone who's patient and has a more of a gentle spirit and a controlled spirit, um, he, he, he'll quiet that, that quarrel. Now, I want to get on with, just to the very end here, just to kind of close, but it's not a closing, so just to, to reiterate and to explain what I mean to react versus to respond. This is so important. And this is how I've learned this, and I've been teaching this for almost 20, 30 years, almost my whole life. And I've used this in my own um, life, and just trying to exercise this every time that I do get angry. Again, anger is caused by basically a denial of rights. I, I believe that I shouldn't be dealing with a situation, this person, if I'm driving down, if I'm driving my car, somebody cuts me off. Yeah, I do get angry, and I, my son's here can even testify that. I, I, I hate, you know, things because something, that should not be happening. I have a right to go here without somebody cutting me off, and suddenly, boom. Now, in the split second, I can react to that situation, therefore be my own judge, react to it, and sometimes I do, I confess, and then you have to, conf have to ask for repentance, but you react to it, or we train ourselves to respond to God. And then we do our actions. I'll tell you what I mean. To react to the situation completely is to take you over completely. You are, you're focused not on God, and you're focused on your own rights being denied, and your focus is on that particular thing or that person. That's what you're focused on. 
You're dealing with a situation in your own strength and your own wisdom. You're angry and you're, boom, you say things. And at the moment, friends, you may, even a second after you say it, I said, I wish I didn't say that. But you said it because at that moment, a split second, you can justify anything with anger. I said it. I deserve to say this. I have a right to say this. And sometimes you don't. If some guy cuts you off, you roll down your window, blah, you bang something out. And you say, oh, why did I do that? But the second you did it, you feel justified to do it. So you're dealing with, in a situation, in your own strength. This is reacting to the situation. Your reason, your passions, your thoughts, etc., are all directed to the source of your anger, not to God. How can you say you're, you're, you're taking all, every thought captive to, to Christ when you're focused just on the person or the thing that's making you angry and you're, and you're reacting to it? Your mind is off God. That's why it says in James, the, the wrath, the anger of man, you cannot fulfill the righteousness of God because your mind is not on God when it's, in, when it's directed to the things making you angry. Um, like I said before, your reasons, uh, your passions, and thoughts, away from God, any action is therefore justified in that moment. And one becomes a law unto themselves. I've said it. I have a right to say it. I'm blasting this person out. I'm angry with the situation. I see what's going on. I'm angry. You know, we have a whole generation. As a matter of fact, I, maybe you know the person's name, but the, the playwright who just died this week, he was famous. He's an English playwright. I forgot his name right now, but very famous. It just missed my mind right now. But he wrote a book in the 50s, and it, was, it categorized the whole generation. Look back in anger. And it was an angry generation. It was a post-war Britain was angry and stemmed over to the States as well. Uh, rebellion and anger, but it's an angry generation, but it's self-centered and just being angry. And at that moment, you are justified and you are law unto yourself. And you can do anything you want with that. The opposite of that, friends, not to react to that situation, but to respond to God. Even if it's a split second, respond to God. That means that one's initial response to anger is directed at God first. God, I'm angry right now. God, I don't know why they did that to me. God, I'm innocent here. You know I'm innocent. God, they have no right to say that against me. He had no right to cut me off like that. You have no right to do this stuff. I don't understand why they're not doing what I, I'm saying. And your response, even for a split second, is to God. Take that anger, and it's real. And that's not the sin. The, the, the anger is not the sin. It's a natural reaction. But what you do with it is a sin. Do I react? Then it becomes sin. Do I respond to God? I res respond to God first, then towards the situation. I ask God, even for that split second, cool my heart. When Jesus saw what they did to his father's house, his first thing, he went to the father. It's not said there, but I know, we know the character of Christ. Him and his father are one. He didn't act out of, out of uh, loss of control. He just didn't flip out. It was a response to God. You've made my father's house this way. And it was, it was a righteous anger because his, 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 he, he was aligned with God. When he saw the Pharisees who were coming against him in hypocrisy because he wanted to heal somebody who was sick on the Sabbath, his response was to God. And then he could look at them in anger and said, you hypocrites, you, you, you blind guides. And he could speak with a, a righteous anger. Because he responded to God first. Not reacting to the situation, responding to God. Then you have the grace of God upon you. And yes, you can speak boldly. You can speak with a fervency and even with you know, intensity. Because you are angry. But you're controlled. Because you've given it over to God. And it, we have to be trained for this, guys. It doesn't come natural. Those of us who know the Lord, we train our minds to take every thought captive to Christ, especially in this area of anger. In this way, one can obtain God's perception of it. Maybe there's a reason why this guy cut me off. Maybe there's a reason why this, this person said what he said to me. You know, I, I, I even shared this last night, or yesterday, I'm sorry, on the street. I saw this one guy I was sharing with somebody on the street, and I guess he was, you know, speaking when I was talking, and so somebody made a comment, but I talked to the person afterwards because the guy was getting angry. Again, he was reacting to the situation. I said, you know, I, I, I thank you for trying to, to defend me as I'm, pre I'm preaching. And, but I said, but you don't know where this guy's coming from. You don't know what happened to him last night. 
You don't know why he said what he said like that. You don't even know his history. Who knows, maybe he had a horrible time with Christianity his whole life, and finally he's in a place that he's listening to the word, and he's reacting to that. I mean, you don't know. I do appreciate you trying to defend me preaching and this guy's cutting me off, but you're a bit harsh there, man, because you don't know what he's what going through. When you respond in your anger to God first, even that split second, we start getting a godly perception of what's going on. We get God's feelings towards it, and more importantly, God's wisdom in every situation that's upsetting you and causing you anger. And you will get angry, friends. As a matter of fact, I, I confess, I was even angry today. Just things, just in life, it just happens all the time. We live in a world that just angers us, frustrates us. And you just say, okay, God, this is, this is what I am. And then, you know, Ephesians also says, you know, do not go to, you know, do not let the sun go down with your anger. You know, anger is not the sin, friends, but if I'm going to meditate on it, that's not God. And I tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm with everybody here. I, I, I'm in the same lot. I, I do stew over things, you know. I, I, I replay the tape in my mind. I do all the stuff. And it's a discipline. No, God, cut the tape. And it says, do not let this, the sun go down in your anger. means that at the end of the day, give the, respond to God with this and don't react to the situation, but respond to God in this. God, take this. It, it, and I tell you, your anger could, most times and many times, it is justified. You know, there was some rights of yours that have been denied or there's been, people that have abused you. I don't mean... In that sense, but you're just taking advantage of you, say it's a bit of way of putting it, taking advantage of you, or misunderstood you, or something. And you are justified to be angry. And that's not the sin. We cross the border, friends, where we take it up, we make ourselves our own authority, our own wisdom, and then we deal with it without responding to God with this. And I believe, you know, when Jesus is talking about this, going back to Matthew as I close here. He's just talking about unrestrained anger. That when you say to your brother or sister, you know, Raka, you ruin their reputation, you gossip about them, you say false things about them, or even the third level here, or the third thing, say that you fool, even something on that level. Um, that is not right. And Hopefully, we are, we are convicted today. Hopefully, this has been a small help to those listening. As far as the difference between reaction and responding. By nature, we react by a holy nature, by a spirit-filled nature. We respond to God. Amen. Let's just pray.